Welcome back to Global Village. I'm Buddy Kunan, and tonight's topic is sailing for everyone. And uh, still with us is Peter Capitosto, and he is the Commodore of the Taal Lake Yacht Club. And joining him is Michael Storer, and he is a ship designer from, uh, uh, sailing a sailing boat designer from Australia. Yes. Yeah, so welcome back, Peter, and of course, Michael, to Thank Global you, Village. Now, um, before we jump into uh, to the, the topic, let's talk about the video we saw just, right, uh, just now. Um, and uh, we saw a lot of boats Peter, on Taal Lake, and these are actually Michael's babies. These, yeah. are, the, these, are, the, these the, are the geese, the Oz geese. The, yes. Okay, so let's talk about your background first, uh, Michael. How long have you been a, uh, a sailing boat designer? Um, I, my intention um, was to become a sailing boat designer when I was quite young. I started sailing about 12 years old, and by the age of 15 or 16, I was starting to draw boats on every available piece of paper from envelopes <laughs> to <laughs> tissues in restaurants uh, and so on. Uh, later on, I was, uh, I was able to get to university and do some years of um, mechanical engineering, uh, then found that the course didn't really quite answer my needs because the industry in Australia was quite narrow, dealing with small parts of commercial shipping. So when I saw the senior students working on the air conditioning ducts in a bulk ore carrier, I went, oh my God. It's not for you. That's not for me <laughs> at all. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this led you on the road to, to uh, sailboat design. Yeah, sailboat design, and I got through to that through building boats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I started work with a company in Adelaide, Australia called Duck Flat Wooden Boats, and I spent lots of time um, uh, cutting up kits of, of other designers' work. So I was really able to get a very clear idea what the state of the art was yeah. uh, by seeing what the people I wanted to emulate were doing. Yeah. How long have you been in the Philippines, Michael? Uh, five years. Okay. In that time, um, how would you describe our local, uh, you know, the, the local sailing scene? Because you come from Australia, yes. and you know it's pretty much a coastal, you know, it's a, it's, mm. a, it's it's really coastal based. You know, you have the west coast where you have uh, Adelaide and Perth and all that. Perth, right? And yes. east coast, you have Brisbane. You've got Sydney, of course, the biggest cities. And um, very vibrant, very active sailing community. And it's not like the rich folks. It's like people, you know, middle class folks have boats. It has been. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the middle class grew in Australia. Uh, and, the, and people started building their own boats. Uh, and the result of that was that small sailing clubs started in almost every bay around the big cities and at the major town centres in between the main yeah. cities. Yeah. Uh, and that period actually formed the basis of the marine industry. But what we've seen since then is that boats have become more and more expensive mm. over time mm. with a tendency to move to higher and higher tech solutions so the boats have become exclusive again, oh really? and okay. people aren't able to afford them so easily. So we've seen the contraction with lots of small sailing clubs disappearing. Um, and it's, I became very disaffected with the cost of sailing, that it was too expensive for me to sail fast boats. So as a designer, I became oriented towards the idea of how to solve this problem, how to make boats with modern performance out of really simple materials that people can buy and make them themselves and, and really make themselves, no? yeah, like your absolutely. Oz Goose. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah. yeah, so I write the plans for the boat as an instruction book to take someone who hasn't built a boat or <laughs> built a <laughs> box in their life yeah. <laughs> and to build a box like boat. So to make it idiot proof, basically, to, to yeah, you know, just, a, yeah. just a very simple design and to make this accessible to you know, the, 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 the vast yeah. majority of people who, who don't have experience yes, and, and the money. The, and then there's a lot of support from social media as yeah. well, which is the new thing, that um, on different Facebook groups for my boat, people are reporting their building and they're asking questions. And the people who have built the boats before answer the questions, which means I don't have to be online all the time. It, it grows, it, has, it takes on a life of its own. When yeah, you, and that's the yeah. beautiful thing about social media and all yeah. these groups coming on Facebook. Yeah, and so someone's got a problem in, um, they, in they Canada. They help each other out. And then someone in Spain answers the question because they face the same circumstance. Okay, let's talk about the Oz Goose. And we saw the photos on Taal Lake. And I understand my, uh, Peter has a, a whole lot of geese in his stable. Yeah. And so let's talk about um, how, how much is an Oz Goose? 
here. Let's say if you were to build one or buy one in the Philippines. Okay, if you build, so, because before yeah. I go into that, people Sorry. think that you know boat is like, well, I need you know several hundred thousand or million, or several million pesos to have a boat to learn how yeah. to sail. How much in Osgoose? Yeah. Um, with the Osgoose, uh, if you build it yourself, the cost of everything, literally everything, the sail, the ropes, the plywood, the glue to stick it all together, the little bit of fiberglass that we use, and the other parts of the boat comes to a little bit over 40,000 peso. Th that's with everything? Everything. From, from, where, from, from workshop to water, you're good to go, 40,000. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then <laughs> if you have one built completely for you, yeah. um, ready to put in the water the day that you get delivery, it's about 80, 85,000. You know, I saw the tagline, and I couldn't believe it when, when it said that you know, it's as much as an iPhone. And yes. I, I couldn't believe it until, you yeah. know, 40,000 pesos is an iPhone. Now, uh, Peter, how is this helping? Because your aim really, and you've been in this, the, the recreational sailing scene here for a long time, and your aim really is to spread awareness of this. How is this helping? I'm sure this is a big boost to the geese, or a big it boost is. to your efforts. It is, absolutely. Um, the, the, the Oz Goose, uh, combined with uh, the program that we have to continually uh, keep the boat sailing, um, I, I see that as a very good way for so many uh, different segments of society to get into the program. Uh, earlier we were saying that, you know, somebody would have an idea that, uh, well, I want, I want to build a boat. Finally, I want to I wanna get into sailing. Sailing is something that I want to do um, and get my family into. Yes. So, uh, our in Taale Gat Club, we've always been focused on family. So, um, get the family into it. It's it's a um, it's a nice family project, which brings the brings sure. the family together. You will always have traditionally in the Philippines. Maybe you'll have a driver. You'll have somebody who also works with their hands. Maybe a gardener. Yeah, bring them along. You know, and it, we all do it together. And so it brings the household together, and uh, it it allows everybody to. Uh, it will allow you, for example, to get in and, and, and get a boat that is inexpensive. Prior to the geese coming on board, what kind of boats did you use? Um, we've had many different phases, right? But um, they were mostly rental boats rather than uh, build it yourself. Um, and uh, they were much, much more expensive. How much uh, are we like talking about? Let's say, say the Hobies. Five times as much. Oh, wow. and, and the Hobies? Oh, yeah. Hobies would be like ten times as much or or more, um, so it the the goose with the way that that comes in uh, as has has been a great boom. Uh, we've gone from uh, maybe two or three geese three years ago, four years ago to like ten and then twenty uh, and then. By probably by the end of the year, we'll probably have 30 geese wow. at the club. Wow, very and good. The nice thing about this program um, is depending on how you sign up for the program, whether it's going to be you and you're going to pay for it as your own boat and it's going to cost a little bit more, or you can go into a, a, a program where um, you decide that you will race the boat and be involved with that and if you don't race it you will allow somebody else to sail it and maintain it okay, um, okay. then those boats will be out all the time and you'll see more and more and more people getting involved even though they don't own a boat uh, they don't even own a goose but they let's say they're your it's your crew you're the guy who sailed with you and well you can't go this week they'll bring it out in the water they'll take it out on the water and they'll probably bring somebody else with them very good so um, it and, and that that just keeps on getting that group just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger and and since the goose is very affordable the guy you brought with you is probably going to say, you know, I want one for my own. <laughs> so then he'll bring one, and then he'll have that, that situation where he's going to be so paying that go, It goes viral. And yeah, it goes viral, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Now, Michael, what makes the goose special, and how are you able to bring down the cost, like yeah. 40,000 pesos, yeah. which is nothing really these days? So I, I design a whole range of boats uh, from uh, 8 feet up to uh, 35 feet, and the basis of all the boats is plywood. 
um, because it's something you can get anywhere. Plywood, okay. Yes. It's just, just marine plywood just that marine, you can buy in the marine, hardware store. Marine plywood. Okay. So it's accessible yeah. around the world <laughs> um, with some glue and um, a small amount of fiberglass. Uh, and we put it all together with um, temporary screws and then we take the screws out because the glue does the whole job. The glue will also fill any gaps, so people get nervous. I'll build the boat <laughs> and it'll sink, <laughs> but yes, if there's a gap yeah. there, the glue will fill the, the gap completely yeah, yeah. structurally. Uh, so that makes it extremely foolproof. And then the thing that the person needs or the group of people need is a set of instructions that take them from the first step, once the first step is done, to the second step, to the third step and so on. And before they know it, they've got a boat. You know, people watching this and hearing you talk about plywood and boats and glue <laughs> are probably thinking, yeah. I mean, how tough are these things? Because plywood is like kind of like this, you know? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, a very yeah. thin material that people use for, you know, with the ceiling or, or whatever, yeah. no? But, but how, how, how sturdy is the goose? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Australia built its, um, its, its whole sailing fleet, its whole small boat sailing fleet, on plywood that is much thinner than we use for the goose. The wow. goose is actually quite conservative. So uh, basically I've taken the ho all the ideas of the racing boats from when I was young and kept the expensive features out of them that have appeared later. So we've actually got boats that are very similar to the 1960s and 1970s. The racing boats, yeah. Uh, racing boats and recreational yeah. boats, but but without the uh, the without the without the, the expensive bits. Yeah. But the sophistication is still there. The person follows through the plan step from one to the other, and when they get at the end, they don't quite realise what a sophisticated thing the boat actually is. And anyone who's a high-level sailor like Peter will look at the boat and go, "Strange-looking boat," <laughs> and then they'll look at the details and say, "Oh." That's right, and that's right, <laughs> and this is exactly what happened. Is the that first time really? Is that the first time you, you when you saw it? What were yeah. your impressions? I said that looks like your grandmother's aparador that somebody kicked <laughs> over and put a mast in it. It's not going to sail. There's no way. Yeah, it, it can look kind of boxy, you know. I mean, but uh, yeah. The, but what happens is that uh, Michael, to his credit, has uh, taken. Ha he, he's considered that the boat really sails a little bit on its side. And so that boxiness really doesn't make any difference. And when, as, a, as an experienced sailor, when you start sailing the boat, what you find out is that it behaves better than many of the other boats that you have sailed in the past. And um, you then start saying why, and then you kind of understand that this, this boxy boat really works <laughs> well because <laughs> the lines are straight instead of being curved. Yes, yes. And so uh, and so in in some points of sail the boat performs much better and then you get onto other uh, points of sail where it's very beneficial for the boat to be flat but the other boats that you've traditionally sailed around and this boat just takes off. Very good, so very good, bravo. It, uh, it's really, it's very, very, it's very, very different. There is something I would like to add to though, and that is when we talk about racing boats, traditionally we think about um, racing as, as being fast. The, one of the most important concepts that you need to understand with racing um, is that there are two kinds of racing. Um, there are two classes of boats, shall we say, or even, even in cars. Um, where you have unlimited and then you have one design. One of the beauties of uh, the, the Oz Goose is it's inexpensive and partly it's inexpensive because it's a very strict or relatively strict one design class. Um, and Michael is moving towards that more and more. Um, the, the development stage, there's some development that is allowed but generally the boat is one design. So it means you can't really change much. And when you can't change much, then you're going to keep costs the same. Why the old boats 
got, which started out as being very inexpensive, became so expensive. So all the add-ons and, and technology, the yeah, add the, the and improvements, technology and improvements, yeah. Improvements yeah. Or yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And, and this and the, and the goose isn't really like that. Very good. Wait, guys, we have to pause for a break. We're going to come back. We'll talk more about that. What, what are exactly these add-ons that make boats expensive these days? We're, al we're also going to talk about the PHPYC, the Philippine Home Builders Yacht Club. You come back. So guys, stick around because more with Peter Capatosto and Michael Storer and Sailing for Everyone on Global Village Returns.